Okay. Thank you for coming out tonight. And um, as we get started, the song, the, the theme song, can you put up the first, um, first verse of that? Is that handy? Is that too hard? Is that too difficult? Quiz question. I'm a teacher, so, you know, you have to have quizzes, and then you're going to say, oh, I'm not coming back here, man. I have to take a test. We were talking about it at the lunch, of what do you do when all the students are, like, failing a test, you know. Up the grades as a teacher, and I'm not going to tell you my secrets. So. The, 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 uh, the first, the first, uh, that's it, that's it, that's it. So, walking in the sunlight all my journey, over the mountains, through the deep vale, Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. And actually, that, that quotation there, I'll never forsake thee, there's a, there's a second part to that. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So, with, except for Paul, where is that verse found? Where is that promise of Jesus found? I will never leave thee. Nor for, you look, I mean, you can use concordance, whatever you need to do to find it, okay? I mean, I'm expecting Eduardo. He's going to find I mean, come on, these, or, or, or Mark. I mean, come on, these, these educated young men. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Where is it found? Mike, come on. Where, oh, go ahead, go, yeah, use your phone. There you go. There you go. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Mark, read Hebrews 13.5. Stand up and read the whole thing for us. Oh, you lost it again? Oh, it was the concordance. He only got partly there. You got the right reference. Though. Amen. Here's my reward. Here's my reward. Again, reward for him and bribe for you, okay? You, you probably have never been in a church service where preachers aren't asking for money. They're giving money, all right? So I'm a, I'm a preacher that gives money, right? And um, I praise the Lord for those of you that see the value of, of learning where things are in God's Word, especially a promise like that. You could switch it now to the, to the main slide for tonight. I mean, think about that. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Except when, uh, that's not in that verse. But if you, no, it doesn't say but if. It's what we call an unconditional promise. I mean, even the beginning of the verse has commands in it. But he doesn't say, well, if you keep these commands, then I'll never leave you nor forsake you. No, he just said, hey, don't do these things because I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. So don't be covetous for money. Don't, don't be worried about life's kind of trials in those areas. I'm never going to leave you, leave you or forsake you. <clears throat> now tonight, the big word, no money for this one, is the second word in our series of five. For these revival services. And what was that word? Sanctification. Sanctification. And if you ever have a big word, you know what to do, right? You break it down a little bit. Sanctify. Sanctify. Oh, okay. Now it's making a little bit more sense. Sanctification sounds really big. Sanctify. Well, let's think about that a little bit. To sanctify. Well, that kind of sounds like a religious word, doesn't it? You know, to sanctify something. Something that a priest does, right? He sanctifies a, a house or a cow or whatever. And so what do you, what's in your mind when you, when you, when you think of that concept? Uh, it's kind of like getting a, a special, what, blessing or something, you know, to sanctify it, make it holy, make it special. And so here's, here's, a, here's a priest 
making something special in the sight of everybody that's watching or, or making it special in the sight of God, right? Because it's a God thing. And so when you're thinking about sanctification, there is a little bit of that going on. Except there's not a priest involved in terms of a human being. There's a high priest involved. His name is Jesus Christ. And he is putting his work into a life or into a house, or, but he's, he wants to do it into a life. He wants to put his work, his hands upon a life to set it apart, to be special and holy for his use. That's what sanctification is. And so when we're talking about tonight is, remember this morning was salvation. And that is asking Jesus to be in your life, asking him to be the light of your life. And you can't go into sanctification where he's going to take your life now and set it apart for good use. You can't get to sanctification if you're not saved. He's not in your life. He's not going to put his hands on your life and set you apart for use. But it's amazing how the two are kind of, kind of tied together. As I just did, you can't have the one without the other. But they're also tied together in the sense that, and this is very important, sanctification won't get off into, into a good start in your life until you're really sure you're saved. You know, there are people who make decisions of salvation. And maybe, I think we had a decision this morning for salvation. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I don't know what Paul does here, but let me, let me just tell you what I think, is when we hear about a man or a woman or a child making a decision of salvation, we should say, praise the Lord. They made a decision of salvation for Christ. I do, however, feel, again, Paul, I'm, I'm, we haven't talked, so hopefully we're in agreement with this. I do, however, feel that it's not my job or the pastor's job, to say to the person, now you're saved. And here's why I say that. Now, they may be. And they made a decision for salvation, which is part of what God is looking for. The Father's looking for a heart of faith. And so when we hear a decision, we, we are hearing what we think should be there in the heart. And, and so we're hoping that. I don't have special glasses, and I know Paul doesn't. We, we can't see the heart. And so with that hope there, we have to still wait, I think, and I tell the person who makes that decision for Christ. Now it's your job to look to see how God is changing your life. Because if your faith really is in Jesus, if you're trusting only Jesus to save you from your sin, and the Father sees that, He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. You're going to have the new birth. And with the new birth, there is going to be changes taking place. And the changes will start that sanctification process. But what I found, and maybe you found this too, is a lot of times when a person makes a decision for Christ, like I did when I was young, and I talked about that this morning when I was young, making decisions for Christ over and over again. The focus sometimes for that person, and, and maybe it's just because they weren't given some good instruction or whatever, the focus sometimes is on that decision. Now, I know, how many of you, I've, I've heard this is like a Roman Catholic area, right? How many of you are from a Roman Catholic background? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I lived in Ireland. My wife and I lived in Ireland for 12 years, and we lived down in southwest uh, County Kerry in Ireland, which was 99% Roman Catholic. That was the culture. Uh, when you walked, this was in the 80s, when, uh, when you walked down the street on a Sunday, people looked just like you and I do today, you know, coats and ties <laughs> and uh, um, all the rest. <clears throat> and they were taking their kids to church, you know, dragging them to church like you bring your kids. And uh, that was the whole town. It was like a, you know, Southern Baptist town, if you put it that way. Or how this town would have been perhaps maybe also a couple decades ago, a Catholic 
ethos. But now that ethos has, has gone away, even in Ireland and, and pretty much here. And people, if they show up to church, it's even in the Catholic Church, right? It's Easter, Christmas maybe. And, and, and definitely not twice on a day. Twice in a day, man, that's a big deal. <clears throat> but in Ireland, I remember when I first learned this. I was going to a shoe store, and I was um, buying some shoes for hiking, because beautiful hiking in Ireland, places to hike. No, no mosquitoes. Uh, you have midges, which are kind of like mosquitoes. You know what midges are. From the south, you know what they are. They're little bugs that kind of bite you. <laughs> but, but no mosquitoes, and no snakes, and, uh, and no trees. It was really barren, like it's bog land type of hiking. So, but you get a view then, you see everything. And so um, I was in, in Mr. Bat Coffee's shoe shop. Bat, B-A-T-T, -T, Bat, short for Bartholomew and this. Um, and I remember, you know, giving an opportunity to witness to, to him, and, uh, ordering some shoes, some hiking boots that weren't available. He, he could order them, but they weren't available there at the shop. My size wasn't that big feet. And I remember giving him the gospel track. I said, Bat, would you, would you do me a favor? Would you read this and tell me what you think when I come back to pick up my shoes? So after I've been talking to him and giving him the track, I came back. And I said, Bat, what did you think of the track? And Mr. Coffey said, boy, he said, I really like that piece of paper, that track. He said, especially that prayer on the back. Man, I was, I was getting kind of excited, you know. Sin, sinner's prayer on the back, you know. And he said, yeah, I pray that prayer every day. Well, I mean... That's the way he was trained. It was like, if you got a good prayer, man, that's going to work good stuff for you. And so keep praying that, and maybe something good is going to happen, right? I mean, that's kind of the mentality you're brought up with in a religious context like Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy or Lutheranism, some of those more you know, high Anglican kind of churches kind of brought up with that mentality, right? And so I learned, and uh, I was young back then, 84, uh, 1984. Um, that, that I needed to understand that I need to help them see it's faith in a prayer. It's not faith in coming forward down an aisle. Not that those things are wrong or bad. Not that they might be good expressions of your heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does speak. And so we as preachers, we're looking for that. We're looking for coming down the aisle. We're looking for praying a prayer. We're, you know, we're looking for those things. But we want to help the person see that salvation is not caused by a prayer. A, salvation is not caused by coming down the aisle. Salvation is not caused by baptism. Salvation is not even caused, now listen carefully. Salvation is not even caused by faith. Salvation is caused by God's grace through faith. And faith is, here's, here's the best picture I can come up with. Faith is like a tunnel. And the tunnel is the opening into your soul. And you, you have to open that tunnel. You have to have that tunnel there. But God drives the truck <laughs> of regeneration through that faith into your soul. In fact, that regeneration changes the tunnel. It makes it permanent. You, you can't, and this is the important part of what I'm getting at right now as far as sanctification. If you are truly saved, you can't stop believing. You see the change in your mind and in your heart that you knew wasn't there before. Before there was doubts. Before there was, I was wondering, you know. Um, but as bad as life can be, and I tell you, it can get, it can get, even for pastors and preachers, and it can get pretty bad. I mean, we, we might not face maybe outward stuff that you face, but hey, if you worked for the devil, who would you go after? I know, if I worked for the devil, I'd go after Paul as much as I could. <laughs> Mess him up, you know. 
and that's why you should pray for your pastor and the pastor's wife and, and, and the pastor's kids. I tell you what. That was more important to pray for the pastor's wife and kids than it is for the pastor to pray for the pastor. Because the devil's not stupid. He knows how to get at the leaders. He didn't go, he, devil didn't go after Adam, did he? No, he does. Don't, don't get me wrong. He, he does frontal attacks to the leaders as well. But, but it's a very important that we pray because it's, it's through the power of God through prayer. Again, the prayer isn't causing the victory. It's the power of God in answer to prayer. And, and it's not trusting a prayer when you're praying for your pastor and his wife and kids. You know. Trusting God to put that hedge of protection, to give that wisdom, give that guidance. And, and the youth pastor and, and the other leaders, your own kids, your own marriage. I got off on a tangent there. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, where was I? So, praise the Lord, Bat got saved. We did home Bible studies. I'm going to talk about that with you on Tuesday, Tuesday night. Talk about soul winning. Pat, Pat Coffey did a home Bible study with his eight kids, and, and uh, half of them got saved as well. And people from a Roman Catholic background, you know, you make great Christians. I, I mean, I can tell. We have some great testimonies here. Because what happens, you know, they already have a reverence for God. They already have a kind of a fear of God, right? Fear of hell. And, and, uh, and yet when they come to know Jesus and the freedom of salvation in Jesus, it's like, man, the shackles are off. The shackles of religion are, are gone. <laughs> and I know Jesus personally. I don't have to go to him through all kinds of other people. I can go to him because he loves me. And gave himself for me. And, and you can talk to the Lord. You know. And that's, that is what's sanctification. That's where we're heading right tonight. Is when you know for certain that your trust is only in Jesus for your salvation. And you have watched God pour his grace through that trust into your life. And you begin to see changes that you know you haven't started practicing new things and those practices have caused changes and that can happen religion has all kinds of practices you can do and and, and uh, they're good it's not they're not bad practices but you have to be able to discern is God making the change or am I and and most of the things God does. Yeah, they, they eventually come out. Because if, if, if he's making changes inwardly, they do come out in practices. But you can put on the practices, and you can even feel good about putting on the practices, but never really have the change inside. Because you still doubt, you still struggle. With... Well, let me, let me give an example. You know the story of the woman at the well. And you know a little bit perhaps about the story that she went out to the well in the middle of the day. And you really didn't do, which reminds me. Brother Paul said I could take my jacket. And it's the middle of the day as far as it feels for me, right? You know, it's hot. Man, it's hot. <clears throat> and uh, the woman at the well was out there in the middle of the day. And we kind of figure out from the story that it's because of her background. You know, she, did, she just didn't want to meet people because of her background. Jesus finally brought up the story of her background in the conversation he was having with her. Um, <clears throat> because he really wanted her to know him. And he, he first invited her to living water. And um, she was kind of confused about that, as you know. And, she was kind of confused also because he's a Jew and, and she's a Samaritan and he's a man and she's a woman. And, and so she was, she was kind of pushing back a little bit, uh, brought up religious questions. You know, you Jews worship in Jerusalem and we, we worship this mountain. And 
And then Jesus finally cut through it all and said, well, go call your husband. And if you know the rest of the story, Jesus reveals himself to her as the Messiah. And she goes and tells everybody, this guy knows me. He knows everything I've done. This, this might be the Messiah. And, and she's still seeking, I think. Who knows? Maybe, she, maybe she's a believer at that point. But she brings other people <laughs> to come meet Jesus. She's not even embarrassed anymore. And maybe that shows that she is really saved because she's not even embarrassed to go in front of other people. And she's drawing them out to meet this guy, this man, this Jewish man, who told her everything that she had done and yet accepted her, loved her, wanted to give her water, living water. And the town, the town comes out, and, and they say, now we believe that he is the Savior of the world. Not just because of your words, talking about the woman, because they heard him for themselves. But to, just to show you that that doesn't just happen in Jesus' day. I like interacting with people on, on Facebook, uh, podcasts, things like that, because it's amazing. You can, you can reach the world through this little thing. The world can reach you through this little thing. No, the what? That's what I'm saying. The, the world can reach you. Sin can reach you, too, through, through this, right? And, and, and we're going to get to that in a minute here. Time is... But a woman at the well, private message to me. And I just want to read a little bit of what she said here to give you an idea that God is still in the same business. There, there, there's nothing new under the sun. He said, I never felt good enough ever since I was a young child. I grew up in church but lived a terrible sinful life. I kept saying I was a Christian, but I wasn't. Four years ago, I did have a somewhat genuine repentance where I promised never to sexually sin again. Then after three years of celibacy, I went back to sexual sin. Two months or so made me think, or two months or so that made me think I had, had lost my salvation. And that's what was really bothering me. I did grieve and I felt guilty after I did feel conviction, but I, I convinced myself it was okay as I was going to marry the guy. She had already had four. And the guy she was living with was not her husband. <laughs> and so, so you can see there's a little bit of similarity there. <laughs> and I'm not going to read you the whole story, but, but she, um, after the four, she had given up. She had given in to Jesus. She had gotten saved. And then she meets this wonderful Christian man. <laughs> And he wasn't wonderful enough to wait until marriage. <laughs> but they had, unfortunately, relationships then before marriage. And I say, unfortunately, because now it's bothering her. She had gotten saved. She had promised God that she wouldn't do that again. She did it. <laughs> she married the guy, and they've been happily married for a couple years now. Now she's, she's doubting her salvation. That's the point I'm trying to get at, right? That sanctification, victory, which is, which is for her, is a victory over the sexual sin because she's married to this guy now anyway and, and that, that she had premarital relationships with. But it's, it's victory over the guilt that she feels that may have taken away her salvation, which is part of her upbringing. She was taught you can lose your salvation. It's part of her upbringing which is part of the upbringing of a lot of people with Roman Catholic background. You know, you can commit a mortal sin that kills your salvation. You can get it back then by going to confession, and doing penance, and taking communion. Right? But what she needed to hear was what? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And she really believed that Jesus had come into her life 
after those that period of time of 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 being away from God, her, her family upbringing, her religious upbringing, and living sinful life for twenty some years, four different men, she really believed that now she was saved, and I think she really was. But then she fell, right? And we all fall after we're saved. But there's a difference now. And there was a difference in her. Four years of living the high life, who cares? Yeah, it's like living the high life. And, and yeah, you care maybe if you get sick or you care if, if people look down on you, but, but you really don't care because you want to live that life. But when you come to Jesus and he's in you, he begins to change you. The new birth begins to change your feelings, your thinking. Turn to Romans chapter 7. We'll get to, we'll get to 1 John. And I, I'm, I'm not going to have much more time, so don't feel like this is going to go on forever just because we're getting into the Bible now. I wanted to share those things with you because I felt you needed to hear those kind of story backgrounds. Because sanctification, being set apart from sin to help serve God better, because we're going to talk about service tomorrow night, only becomes a, a successful process in your life if you're sure of your salvation. So you have to make sure you're not trusting a prayer, you're not trusting an event, baptism, you're trusting Jesus alone. And you're trusting him to save you from sins. That's why you, that's why you put your trust in him. That was this morning. You weren't just trusting him to save you from hell. You were trusting him to save you from sins. I don't want to do that anymore. And I, she got saved. I don't want to do that anymore. And she gave her life to Jesus. And she lived three years with freedom and victory until she found this guy she wanted to marry. <laughs> and he wasn't faithful. I mean, that's part of the problem. It's the guy, you know. Probably most of the problem is the guy. And so now she's doubting her salvation. So what does she need to look at? Say the right prayer? What did, I, what did I point him to? Did Jesus come into your life or not? Did he, did he start making changes in your life or not? She, she said, yeah, I was different. I began to feel differently. I wanted, I wanted things to be different. And when she fell, how did she feel? I don't want to do that. I messed up. I don't want to. See? The, the wonder is, here's one of the one, best ways you know you're saved, that you have the Holy Spirit within you, is your wonder changes. Now, what is your wonder? That's the real you. It's the Spirit within you. Before you come to Jesus, who's, who's sitting on the throne of your will, of your wonder? Well, we, we can say it's Satan, but it's, it's really you. It's yourself. It's what we call flesh. And he's pushing the buttons. He knows, what the, he knows the buttons to push. Using the world to push those buttons. But flesh, yourself, is sitting on the throne of you, the real you. And that flesh, that old man, that, whatever you want to call it, only wants what? Selfish. Selfish things. And, and the only time the flesh is afraid is is if I get caught and get in trouble, I might suffer something. And that's selfish, right? I don't really want to change for God's sake. See the difference? But when you come to know Jesus and he's living in your life, he is, the flesh is kicked off. The flesh is no longer in charge. Flesh is still there. Flesh is still calling out, hey, why don't you try this? And maybe loud, more loudly than he should, because you're, you're giving him a platform. But Jesus now, by his spirit, on the throne of your, of your spirit. And what you want, what your deepest want, never changes. Now read with me Paul's expression. And I know there, there are theologians that disagree with me. I don't know what 
theologians Mark and, and Edward or Hurd or some of the other men that have had some training. <laughs> I, in fact, I don't know what you've heard on this, Paul, <coughs> about Romans 7. But some, some people say Romans 7 is, is Paul talking before he's saved. I don't believe that. Paul's talking about what it's like to be a believer. And here's what he says. Verse 13. And when I, when I read this, uh, or, or verse uh, 14, when I read this, I want you to look at the word want as I read through it, and, or will, he uses the word will, I think, here in the King James. And I, I want you to ask yourself, when he uses the word will or would, is it always the right thing? You know, hold on, let's, let's look at it. For you know, verse 14, for we know that sin is spirit, uh, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, I still have the old flesh, which is sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not, but what I would, here it is, but what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that I do. And if I do that which I would not, I consent with unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwell in, dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. For if I do that I would not, it is not more that I do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, <laughs> that sounds very confusing. And you may have to read through it really slowly. Or maybe get a, a more modern translation and read through it. But I think what you're going to find is if you, if you read through it, you're going to see that everything he wants to do is right. Everything that he doesn't want to do is wrong, even though he still does it. He says, it's really not me doing it. It's my flesh pushing me, and I give in. Sin dwelling in me. Are you following me? So, so what has changed? His wanter has changed. What he wants to do is always good. What he doesn't want to do, he ends up doing sometimes. But he doesn't want to. See the point? And 1 John, if you're doubting your salvation, the Gospel of John, if you're not saved, if you're here and Jesus is not in the center of your life, and you're, you're just saying, well, I can't wait till this service is over. <laughs> I, want, I want to get out of here. <laughs> and, and your wanter is only aligned with, with the, you know, selfish desires and not really wanting what God wants. Read the Gospel of John. We talked about this this morning. Read the Gospel of John. Maybe there's an inkling already in your spirit. Maybe I should. Maybe I should want Jesus. Because this life is messed up. I'm in charge of this life, and I've messed it up. Maybe he's convincing you now to let him come in and never leave you and forsake you. But if you are here, and you already have him in your life, at least you've confessed him, and you really believe you've chosen him to be your savior, and, and you've begun to see different changes in your life, but you're still failing, you, you've got to stop yourself and, and say to yourself, am I sure that Jesus is in my life? And here's one of the texts. Has my wanter changed? And 1 John is a book written to you. John is written to the unbeliever, that you, may that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. 1 John is written to professing believers who may not be sure. These things are written that you may know that you have everlasting life. John says it at the end of his book, 1 John. So if you're not sure of your salvation... Start reading 1 John. 
Remember, it was God used that to help me come to an assurance of salvation when I was between my junior and senior year. Maybe that's when I got saved. Because that's when I started seeing changes taking place. So 1 John is written so that you can make sure your salvation, and while you're doing that, you may find, well, maybe I'm not saved. <laughs> because you're testing your life against what 1 John says you should test your life. The new birth should be seen in these different ways. One of the ways is that you, you don't doubt that Jesus is the Christ. When, when that new birth, remember I said, when the truck is driven through the tunnel into your soul, it changes the tunnel. And you cannot see yourself ever doubting again that Jesus is the only Savior. You may doubt your salvation, but you don't doubt that he's the Savior. And the only reason you doubt your salvation is because you, you're like this woman. I'm not good enough. I messed up. You know, and there's, Satan's good at wanting you to doubt your salvation. Satan's good at putting doubts into your heart and mind. You have to quench those lies. And so I told her, how do you quench the lie? I'm not good enough. A real subtle lie. Help me out. How do you quench that lie of the devil? When he says to you, well, you're not good enough. You just messed up again. You're not, you're not saved. <laughs> just say, yes, I am. <laughs> good, good army man. Good army, army man. Just, yes, I am. Uh, or Navy. Navy, right? Navy. Navy. Navy and Army. <laughs> yeah, you could just tell them. Just tell them. I gave my life to Jesus, man. I, have not, I don't belong to you. Here's the subtleness. Satan says, you're not good enough. Paul, Paul, you know the answer. You're right. I'm not good enough. They, you throw it back at him. You're not good enough. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I am not good enough. I've never been good enough. But Jesus was good. And I accepted Jesus. And he has changed my life. I don't want that. I saw the change. My wanter changed. I don't want that old life anymore. I messed up, yeah. And it, it shows me again that I'm not good enough because <laughs> I'm not good enough. See, see, the devil's very clever. And you've got to learn that the first step of sanctification is making sure that your trust is only in Jesus. Now, I mentioned baptism. I mentioned the Lord's Finished Prayer. It's a good thing to use, but don't put your trust in it. Baptism, good thing, but that doesn't save you either. Mike, I think, pointed that out this morning. And baptism doesn't save you either, but it's a good thing. And, and if you don't come to, if, if, you got, if you got wet when you were a baby, you got christened when you were a baby, your parents only meant well, right? They only meant well. They, they were only looking out for what they felt was good for you, salvation or whatever. But that didn't do anything except get you wet. Yeah. And babies aren't born again. They're not born again when they get wet. It's through faith that regeneration takes place. So hearing the gospel, uh, the word, born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever, Peter says. Through the gospel, I've, I've begotten you, Paul says to the prisoner. So you, they have to hear the gospel, and babies don't hear with understanding so they can put their faith in the gospel. Father God sees that faith and gives, he drives his regeneration in. But once that regeneration is there, the changes take place, and, and the faith changes so you can't stop doubting You're, that he is Jesus, he is the Son of God. No one's going to convince me otherwise. You don't want to sin anymore. In fact, you don't plan sins. You fall into sin. We all fall into sin. Sometimes we give place to the flesh, and, and, we, and we've got to we've got to change our direction sometimes so that so that our flesh doesn't say, "Yeah, what do you? Hey, you see that? You, you didn't see that before, but now I'm showing you." You know, well, if we if we we steer clear from that, the flesh can't do that. 
But here's my final point. Sanctification is the same as salvation. If we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's 1, 9. But it's easy to, to say, if we say we are walking in the light, it's still sin. We lie. Don't do the truth. When, when you are born again, and Jesus is living in you, and will never leave you or forsake you, that means you can never shut him up. I know people use the verse, don't quench the Holy Spirit. But that's talking about quenching what the Spirit's trying to do through preaching. The spies not prophesying, quench not the Holy Spirit. You can never shut up the Holy Spirit in your life. And when you sin, the way you know you're a sinner is like Paul in Romans chapter 7. People that I don't want to do, yet I do. And for Paul, he'd say, what are you talking about, Paul? You're, you're an apostle. You don't sin, do you? Now, maybe he doesn't do the sins like he did when he was younger. He's not chasing down Christians anymore, <laughs> right? But this is the important thing. Sanctification is getting closer to Jesus. Sanctification is getting closer to the light. Sanctification is not just getting further away from sin, though that results. But if you're trying to get further away from sin, now picture this with me. Here's Jesus. Here's sin in my life. If I'm trying to get away from sin by focusing on the sin that's in my life, oh man, I did it again. Oh, I better not drive that way anymore. Oh, I better not read that book. Oh, I better not use the internet anymore. Uh, and, and, and what can I do? How can I get rid of this sin out of my life? How, how, can I get, how can I deliver myself from my sin? What's the problem? Huh? I'm substituting Jesus. He's the deliverer. I'm not the deliverer. He's the deliverer. He's the one I'm trusting to save me from my sin. And so when I start focusing on Jesus, oh, Lord, what should I do? I fell, I fell again. I get closer to him. I talk to him. I come into the light, and he says, you know what? You think that's a pretty bad sin that you're, you're struggling with. I'll tell you about something else maybe that you should focus on. Forgiveness. Whoa, wait a minute, Jesus. I, I'm, I'm more concerned about this sin that really bothers me. And Jesus says, well, wait a minute. How about let's work on this one first? I'm, I'm serious now. Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. The lack of forgiveness and bitterness may just be the thing that Jesus wants you to focus on first before he's going to help you get rid of those other habits of sin. Mark 11, 26 and 27. You stand praying and you have anything against anyone. Forgive. And your Heavenly Father will forgive you your trespass. But whoever will not forgive another person's trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Now, that verse used to bug me. Because <clears throat> that kind of, man, that means I can lose my salvation. That sort of sounds like it. I can lose my salvation. No, it's not, it's not even talking about salvation. It's talking about you and your Father. You're not going to end up not being a son anymore. Jesus isn't going to leave you. He doesn't forsake you. You can't get him out of your life. But he may say, I'm not going to help you with trespasses, not guilt, trespasses, habits of sin that are in your life that you keep trespassing, you keep going over the boundary. 
because you give it into that flesh. And why is that? Because you have no forgiveness in your heart for that individual. Not that many times. Isn't, 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 isn't lusting and pornography worse than forgiveness? Isn't, isn't stealing worse than forgiveness? Uh, unforgiveness? Isn't, isn't lying worse than unforgiveness? Because he said, if you stand praying, it's not in front of the person who sinned against you. It's if you're standing before God, praying, and, and during that prayer time, you are holding bitterness. You're holding something against someone. You haven't, you haven't let it go. You keep playing that tape over and over in your mind. What they did to you. You keep thinking to yourself, man, they need it. They need to get it good. Because what they did to me, I hate them. And you get that point. If you let this flesh get to that point, that, that's, you should feel guilty right away. Because <laughs> the change of your spirit, I mean, that's the point. If, if bitterness is so deep, you may, you may need to wonder if your wonder has really changed or not. Your wonder could have changed, and you're just having a hard time forgiving. I just, I can't, I just can't forgive them. It just hurts. It just, every time I see them, it just makes me angry what they did. Jesus says, when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, you're lukewarm. Forgive. In his presence. That doesn't mean in front of them. It means in his presence. Luke 17 is more about forgiveness in front of them. You have to forgive in front of him first. And you have to be honest. You have to say, wow, I, I want to. I want to because you want me to. And I want to be with you. I want to be close to you. I want to be close to the light. And the light reveals what you really need to work on. And it's amazing. And you work on what he wants you to work on. You think about it. What makes Christianity different than all the religions of the world? You know, all the religions of the world have some kind of rule. Some of them are kind of funny. You kind of don't do unto others what you don't want to do. You have a negative. So you can just leave people alone. And you'll, you'll, you'll do that rule. Judaism is love your neighbor as yourself. The whole wall of the prophets, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes that's preached as a Christian rule because Jesus taught that as the fulfillment of the Jewish law. But that's not real Christianity, believe it or not. That's, that's Judaism, which is foundational to Christianity. But Jesus said, I have a new commandment that I give unto you. Which is what? That, that you love one another as, as, no, as I have loved you. Think about this now, please. Should we love one another as we love ourselves? Sure, hey, that's a good start. No, no, no problem doing that. But Jesus has raised the bar. His love is for enemies. His love is for people who sinned against him. His love is for those who he cried from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do. His love is for me, who sins against him every day. I break the greatest commandment every day. What is the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I don't want to. My wonder's changed. I don't want to break that commandment. But I break that one every day. And until we get the picture that sins, the values of sins aren't what, how we value them. 
It's how God values them. We won't get towards the light like he wants us to get towards the light. We'll focus on the sins that bother us, that get us in the most trouble, that other people think are the worst sins, because they got their list as well. We, we, get, we feel guilty in front of them. A true sanctification is making sure you're saved, that Jesus is in your life and has changed you. And true sanctification is getting closer to him, and letting him point out what he wants to work. And then saying, okay, I'll do it. I'll drop it and put it in your hands now. You're going to have to help me. I want to follow you. If I was your enemy, I'd still, still do things that are an enemies. Maybe people don't see it, but I know it. I fall short every day. I pay for those things. Thank you, Jesus, for paying for my sins. Thank you for being my sin. Draw close to me because I want to be right. That's sanctification. Let's bow in prayer. Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray for those that are seeking you that aren't aren't saved yet. You you see their hearts, Lord. You know. You know exactly where they're at. Pray for those that are struggling with bitterness because Boy, they've been hurt. They've been hurt badly by other people who've sinned against them. And it makes them angry every time they think about it. But they shouldn't be thinking. They should let those thoughts go. and Help them to think thoughts of love for their enemies. Help them to, to know what to do next in dealing with that forgiveness. May they want more than anything to be close to you, Lord Jesus. To have that light really, really guide them in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would just, oh, now, if you wouldn't mind just looking up here for a second. And I pray that you will think about this. <clears throat> Two things. Remember this morning I said, if you, haven't, if you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, please ask him, who should I go to to pray with me about, about becoming someone who's fully committed to Jesus for salvation? But if you know you're saved, and God has spoken to your heart tonight through this message, and and he wants you to make sure that you are fighting the fight of sanctification the right way. And he's, he's pointing some things out to you. There are two things that maybe you haven't done yet that really will help, I think, in this step process of following Jesus the light. If you have not made sure of your salvation until tonight, you said, you know what, I have been trusting a prayer, I have been trusting baptism, but I need to really trust Jesus. And if you've made sure of your salvation tonight, for the first time, I want you to wait to see what God changes in your spirit. If you begin to see that wanter change, and you, you'll, you'll know. He'll, he'll point out to you the things that, that he, will, he will change immediately, and other things he'll want you to start working on. And I, I, I would recommend that you really do consider getting baptized. Even if you thought you were baptized as a baby or a child. Baptism is an answer, Peter says in 1 Peter 2.30, uh, uh, 3.21. Peter says, baptism is an answer of a good conscience And you have to know you're saved to be able to give that testimony. Maybe you gave it because somebody pushed you into it. I'm not pushing you. I'm saying you talk to Jesus. And if you have made sure of your salvation, baptism really is the next step. If you knew you're saved, and, I, and actually the discussion tonight really helped you, really helped you say, yeah, I, fell, I fall, and I still fall every day, and, and man, I... I Preacher falls every day, and I fall every day. But I know Jesus is my Savior. My wanter has changed. And, and now I've gotten some ideas of how to get closer to Jesus from this message tonight. And so I want to dedicate myself in a way that maybe I've never done before. Now, if you've, if you've made a, 
a commitment of dedication. That's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about Romans 12, 1 and 2, commitment of dedication. That's different than trusting Jesus for salvation. This is by the mercies of God, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It really should be done at baptism, but if you've already been saved and you've already given a testimony of that salvation in baptism, but you know you've not really been dedicated to following Jesus. Here's what I want you to do. Read Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I want you to come forward during the prayer time. Just kneel before Jesus. You don't have to think about it. It's a way of publicly doing it to help solidify in your own heart and mind before others because they're going to be praying for you. They're going to see you there. They're going to pray for you too while they're singing. But it's just a way for you to, in your, in your heart and mind, make invitations stick. Just like weddings where you stand up here and do your vows. But I'm not going to have you do any vows. You do it before God. Say, I am giving my body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to you. It's my reasonable service. I want to be conformed to this world. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind that I might prove, that I might show what is your good and perfect and acceptable will. Sanctification. But it starts with a moment of dedication. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So if that's you tonight, those are the two choices. If you've made sure and you haven't been baptized, think about it. Make sure of your salvation. Watch to see the changes God makes. And then set up a time with Brother Paul, perhaps, or someone where you can make that public testimony of baptism. That's not tonight. Or get dedicated tonight. You're sure you've been saved, you've been baptized, but you really haven't started that walk of sanctification. That act of dedication is really important. Other folks want to do it. Let's stand together just for a moment. Just for a moment. We're going to do this very easy this evening. Very easy. If the Lord has spoken to your heart, if there's business you need to do with the Lord, let's just take a moment and do that business. The altar is open. You're not committing to me. You're not committing to the church. You're committing to Christ. You're not rededicating to me. You're not dedicating to me. You're not dedicating to the church. You're dedicating to the Lord. If the Lord spoke to your heart, you got to settle it. In whatever way that was, we're not going to look at you. We're not going to wonder what's wrong with you. We're going to rejoice that the Lord spoke to your heart. We don't know what he spoke to you about because we're not going to ask you. It's none of our business. Our business in the pulpit is not to play Holy Spirit, but rather to remind, thus saith the Lord. So that's our heart. That's our desire. That's it. So if the Lord spoke to you, would you just settle whatever it is in your heart that He spoke to you about? We'll give you all the time you need. We're not going anywhere. The Lord's sure not going anywhere. But if He spoke to you, will you settle that tonight? The altar is open. Your seats, you can pray right there. Some of you, I can tell, are in your chairs praying. That's fine. It's acceptable. I don't care where you come before the throne of God. Just go to His feet. Just go to His feet. The reason we have you stand is just to give you that opportunity, as Brother Brian said at the beginning, just making that effort and seeing that response, okay? That's all it is, just making that effort. We still have some praying. There's plenty of time. Let's get that settled tonight. If the Lord spoke to you, let's settle it right here, right now, this evening, and not go any further.